Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are in the world. Um, and welcome to this um, brief pre presentation on some of the work that we have done on the issue of survival sex and sexual exploitation of uh, unaccompanied children in, in Greece. My name is Suhail Abul Samid, and I will be with you for the next 20 minutes. Hope you uh, find this presentation um, helpful, useful, and um, easy to, to go through. Um, the issue that we are talking about here um, has been talked about and acknowledged for a while in the field. Um, as we, or some of us might know that um, in Greece, um, there has been an influx of refugees into the country in the last few years. Um, that is more than, than the, the usual numbers in the past. Um, we have seen huge numbers of, of um, people coming in from uh, as far as uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and of course the more um, recent floods from Syria and, uh, and Iraq and the Middle East. Um, the issue here that we are talking about concerns young refugees who have been traveling by themselves was referred to as unaccompanied minors. So these are young people under 18 who is traveling alone from, uh, from their countries for, for whatever reason it is that, that uh, uh, made them leave and be by themselves um, and arriving in Greece without family. Um, we are talking about young people under 18 who under the definitions of most international organizations are considered children. Um, and in Greece, there has been an acknowledgement or, or um, understanding that um, so many of those young, young children are um, engaging at, in what we call survival sex, which means um, having sex or sexual uh, practices with adults um, for the purpose of gaining money um, or services or favors. Um, to survive because uh, of lack of others, other supports or means to, um, to, to live a normal life. Um, mm -hmm. Them being um, young people under 18 brings out the issue of the age of minority, which means um, in definitions, again, of more, more, most international organizations, this is considered sexual exploitation, even if it comes with a perceived consent or approval of, of both parties. And uh, sex between an adult and somebody who's under 18 will be considered sexual exploitation uh, for most um, uh, international organizations, and particularly the UN, and of course for the purposes of this presentation. This also will, will raise the question around potential trafficking issues in this, um, um, in this scene. Uh, before we start, um, the, the presentation or get the, getting into the issue, I would like to present some of the assumptions and myths that, that faced us while we are looking at uh, this issue. I was particularly uh, commissioned by the UNHCR in Greece to look at this issue, create a situation analysis, research, and, and uh, develop a set of recommendations and strategies of how to respond to this, to this problem. Um, and when I started doing this work, I was talking to all kinds of people in the field, service providers and, and, uh, and community members, and I started hearing some, some uh, comments, ideas, thoughts around this issue, and, and, uh, and some of them seemed a little bit uh, odd to hear. That might not be true, uh, more, than, more like myths and assumptions than, than reality. Some of those are things like, that this is, we're just talking about boys. Um, when we're talking about sexual exploitation or survival sex, uh, we're only talking about boys um, where girls are not known to, to engage in this, in this practice. And, and that, that assumption of that uh, the story came, came from a good reason is that the, the more visible uh, individuals who engage in this um, in the parks and public spaces in Greece um, are, are mostly boys. And because of the demographic of those who are engaging in this, and we, we will get uh, to that a little bit later, um, will, um, will mean that, that mostly male young refugees are the ones who are part of this, um, of this group of concern that we're looking at. Um, uh, the other thing uh, is that we are talking only about Afghans, Pakistanis, and maybe some, some people from Bangladesh, young people who are engaging in, in this practice of survival sex or having sex for money and favors. Uh, while others, especially uh, the Syrians and Iraqis, uh, are not known to engage in this. So this is, again, this is, this is 
something I've heard at the beginning. I'm not saying that this is necessarily true. However, there is, there is um, at least visual uh, anecdotal evidence that shows that the majority of young people that are seen and visible um, uh, practicing this, um, this practice are uh, indeed people from uh, places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, they are, there's, a, there's a whole set of reasons and, uh, um, and assumptions of why uh, this is the case, um, but we will not get into details into that. This is not our main topic here. Um, but, but there are there are uh, there is more behind the story of why this is this is the situation. However, it's important to notice that things are changing, and there has been evidence that in the last year at least or two, there has been more evidence that uh, young Syrians, young Iraqis, and people from other places are being uh, noticed uh, or seen to to engage in survival sex. Um, this is um, this is a testament to the hardship and to the um, to the uh, difficulties that young people face. The longer they stay in this situation, and the more they are they are stuck in a in a very difficult situation, like they are in in Greece. Um, we've also heard um, some some stories, and this was probably one of the most troubling assumptions and myths, and some of. Uh, uh, one that's more concerning that people actually re- repeat it and, and, and say it is that um, sex between men and boys is common in Afghani culture. Again, this is not, I'm not saying that this is true at all. I'm saying that this is something that's been um, uh, talked about. People have been sharing these stories. Um, and that, you know, based on these, these stories of the dancing boys that are in Afghanistan, um, where um, young people are being, you know, um, taken in by warlords and tribal leaders to to engage in these kind of uh, um, practices of entertaining the older men and sometimes engaging in sexual behavior with them. Um, and although there there's some little little truth to 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 some of these incidents happening, of course this is uh, um, this is not a consensual uh, practice. It's not that widespread that widespread and it's not common enough to um, to use it as a justification or as a, a, a reference point to why this is happening and the big problem here that when we are repeating these stories we are almost saying that this is a cultural practice that should not take as much attention and concern from us as practitioners and service providers um, so this is this is one of the more troubling um, assumptions or myths that I've been hearing um, in the field um, one other thing that um, is quite common and, and, um, and creates challenges for us in terms of uh, how to design services and response is that we look at people who have sex with each other from the same gender or the same sex as, um, as homosexuals or um, men who have sex with boys, boys who have sex with boys are considered gay. Um, and which often leads to interventions being designed to look at things like sexual orientation uh, rather than all the other issues that are coming with it. Um, this is this is quite problematic, of course, because that takes um, away uh, from the realities of of, uh, of uh, exploitation, of the need uh, that the young people have to that leads them to engage in that. The ideas around sexuality and sexual orientation that are very Western-based and coming from a Western lens that does not really address um, uh, cultural realities and, and how people engage uh, intimately and physically with each other in different cultures. Um, so, so that's um, that's something that that organizations might need to start um, looking carefully into before designing programs and strategies that might be uh, focusing in the wrong in the wrong place um, when it comes to this issue. Um, we hear also a lot about uh, transactional sex being associated often with drug use and drug dealing and, and human struggling. Uh, again, um, w- w- the research and the situation analysis showed that although there is some correlation and some connection between uh, particularly drug use, uh, um, and sex work, um, there is no real evidence that sh- says that um, that they are always connected to each other or that people are engaging in sex work to buy drugs or to be trafficked. The amount of money that people are making from, from uh, survival sex um, 
doesn't seem to be significant enough to to cover their their uh, trafficking needs or the cost of um, of uh, leaving the country in in, um, in a trafficking kind of manner um, and a drug use um, some we've seen in some cases where um, some young men are in are uh, uh, consuming drugs and they might be needing more money for that but that that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the cause and effect of um, of the issue of survival sex um, and lots of the lots of the programs or the conversation has started um, our, uh, on this uh, have always been focused on unaccompanied minors so young people without families and parents um, and this is something that we need to examine carefully to see if it's only uh, those who are engaging in survival sex or um, would others who have their families or or direct adult uh, relatives with them um, are vulnerable to this practice or already engaging in it. And, and my conclusion is that um, in a place like a refugee camp or an, an urban refugee settlement, um, the the young kids are all hanging out with each other and going out to the city and 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 um, and playing and, and doing all sorts of things. Um, while the parents don't necessarily have the capacity and and the ability and the time and and the energy and and, and all sorts of things to uh, to monitor and supervise their children all the time. So um, I'm not sure that that we should. Be limiting our focus or effort only on unaccompanied um, minors when it comes to survival sex. Um, while doing this work and research, uh, we have to look at a uh, few or some of the considerations and limitations that came up that might uh, we might need to keep in mind while we are examining this issue. Um, the refugee population is, of course, very diverse. People come from all sorts of backgrounds, um, cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, class backgrounds, religious backgrounds, education. Um, and we, we often have, in the narrative of, uh, of humanitarian work and development work, we refer to refugees as this one monolithic kind of uh, group uh, that they all look the same and sound the same and have the same needs and the same... Um, and the same backgrounds, which is obviously not not um, not true. And in this particular story, we've seen how we are looking at people coming from different countries with very different uh, uh, situations, with very different uh, baggages, with their very different uh, history that is changing the way they are engaging with the host community and they are um, um, participating in the new culture. Um, so the way masculinity for example is expressed and perceived in in one culture might be very different than others where it is from somebody coming from sub-saharan africa it might be different than somebody coming from a middle eastern arab country it might be different than somebody coming from afghanistan or pakistan and we need to be more careful when we're examining um, uh, conversations around refugees uh, and how we look at um, um, at, at the specific stories of each uh, and every one of them. Um, and when we're talking, talking about uh, those young boys uh, that we're looking at, we, we tend to forget that they've had such a, uh, a complex and harsh reality that is causing them to perceive themselves uh, as much more empowered, uh, older, uh, mature uh, than they might really be. Um, when they have, some of them have traveled for months or years sometimes from Afghanistan or Pakistan or others or have lived through harsh realities of war in Syria and Iraq and have arrived here when they're still 15 and 16, some of them have experienced more and had more resilience and had more uh, more, more stories behind their belt than, than so many of us have seen all our lives. And, and that, for them, gives them that, um, that impression or that, that uh, sense of their own adulthood, their own masculinity, their own uh, identity as men, rather than how we see them as, as young men and boys or young boys. Um, and this is, this is just an important factor to consider and look at. Uh, um, not to say that we should not consider them as young boys. Of course, they are children. They are vulnerable, and they need particular attention and support. They have been away from 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 normal childhood for a long time. Um, but 
understanding that they need to be valued and appreciated for that experience that give them a sense of empowerment and and um, and uh, and sense of adulthood that we we do not perceive and see um the issue, of course, is very sensitive. When you go and talk about things like sexual behavior, especially uh, when we talk about survival sex, you know, young people uh, um, engaging in, in sex for money and services and, and favors, um, and particularly coming from cultures where these are considered some uh, practices that are very uh, sinful, we're talking about practices of young, uh, of, of sex with, with people from the same gender, so young boys having sex with men, so already we're, we're at a level of... Uh, of uh, of judgment there on the homosexual behavior, and comes with it the the financial compensation factor and you know uh, um, the reality of the refugee experience. It's not a very easy thing to talk about. So the majority of the stories that you will hear when you are doing this work are anecdotal. It is difficult to find real case studies, not that they we don't see them, they do exist, but to engage in a conversation that will tell us everything in detail um, is a little bit more complicated. So we have to, to rely on, on, uh, on a triangulation of, of various anecdotal evidences um, that will give us the real story at the end. The issue of shame that comes with it, and that's very much tied to their sense of masculinity, um, is uh, is huge in this um, in this story and that's what's going to be limiting them and creating boundaries and barriers around sharing information and and and, and asking for support as well the the other big um consideration um and, and barrier to to our work is is the language issue we often rely on translators and interpreters to uh to connect with the uh, with refugees and people coming from different cultures um and in this particular case, this, this might create a, a situation where it might actually be more uh, of a barrier than it is an opportunity or facilitation uh, factor to this conversation. Um, young people, uh, are, if we are having conversation with them through somebody from their community who's translating, they'll find it even more difficult to go and talk about the issue of, of, of sex work. Um, it's, I've seen in front of me cases where the translator and the interpreter have acted as a gatekeeper, as somebody who's actually blocking the conversation out of their own shame and sometimes of their own need to protect these young people because they don't want to hear or listen to the story or they don't want to translate it. And of course, translating concepts and words and, and the ideas around sexual behavior and sexual identity might end up being more traumatizing through the, using the wrong words, the wrong language, uh, the wrong expressions than, than it is. And we are not putting enough effort and investment in efficient translation and interpretation services uh, or the interpreters themselves being uh, people with much more competency, uh, cultural competency and a subject matter competency to be able to provide this, uh, uh, this service in the more uh, effective way. And this is something that we've uh, we've seen that there's there's a big lack, um, uh, and and um, and often seems like an afterthought with the lots of the services if things designed and then let's go let's go and and bring in some some translators. So we find some people from the local community to act as these these mediators, these translators, these interpreters, um, while they might be not the right right person to do the job. So what do we? No. Now, after all these considerations, limitations, assumptions, and myths, um, spending a few months in Greece, doing research, uh, uh, talking to all kinds of people, uh, engaging with the community, service providers, the refugees themselves, some of the things that came, um, came to our knowledge. Um, first of all, when it comes to, to the young people we, we are working with themselves, the children, the youth, the people of concern, unaccompanied minors, wh whatever we want to call them. Um, they are eventually at the end the young people who we need uh, our support. Um, we found that sex work um, was almost never a first choice for anybody. And that's, of course, understandably so. However, um, it's seen as almost the least risky, and, and I put big quotation marks around risky, 
um, among other illegal activities that they might need to do because there's no legal framework there's no legal avenues for them to gain money and and and, uh, and support so if we're talking about things like drug dealing or theft or smuggling that will much more directly and clearly impact them in an illegal kind of practice while having sex with somebody behind a tree or going to a private hotel room or private apartment is one much less riskier of being discovered but also the implications of it legally are much less um, difficult for them especially in, in greece where uh, where there are much more um, um, openness to same-sex behavior to sex work and to uh, um, uh, just sex sexuality in general than some some other places um, the the other thing that we've noticed that this is really showing the strong psychological impact on young people engaging in sex work um, cases of severe depression are being very clearly seen and and uh, and tied to to this uh, this practice i've seen young people who are doing self-harm um, isolating themselves from others um, and knowing that that this is most probably directly related to to engaging in a behavior that they themselves see very shameful and and very hurtful for themselves um we do know that young people don't see their basic needs met i mean we we when we talk about why they're doing this and trying to get money uh most of us in the service provision sector would say okay well they're um they're getting food they're getting shelter they're getting clothes from service providers um so what what else is what i mean this is this is basic but the reality is i mean young person that's that's that, that's given that they need to have these things um, internet connection is a basic service they need to have a phone that's connected to the internet for entertainment for finding their way around or for communicating with their family for those who want want that um, uh, having a nice haircut um, and looking you know as good as other boys they see around them in the the community going out for ice cream you know simple things that uh, we don't think about um, as as um, as basic, and we think, okay, this is luxury. This is you know, extras, accessories for life. Um, but the reality, is these are young boys who just want to live life like everybody else, and the temptation is very high to go and try to to find ways to to live to live that life. Um, we also realize and see that um, there's very little awareness and, and education or knowledge around the issue of sexual health and sexual transmitted infections. Um, so not only that they are um, not having had that, that education and, uh, and knowledge back home from uh, the countries where they've left, but also they haven't had a chance to have it um, in Greece or in, in host countries and other places on the way. There's also the issue of um, the pressure to engage in unsafe sexual practices uh, for better pay. So a client will pay more for unprotected sex than they would for protected sex. And for these young people who don't really understand safer sex and don't understand uh, things like condoms and, and other ways of, uh, of creating safety or um, or, or contraction of of, uh, of diseases and viruses, they they don't really have the ability to make that judgment of uh, of balancing out an extra twenty euros for for unprotected sex versus a risk that they don't really understand and know. So sexual health is a huge uh, factor that plays in this uh, in this story. Um, we also are seeing that. Um, the ideas of, of um, what sexual behavior is masculine and what is feminine, I mean, what we, we say in common slang language, especially between in sex, uh, between men and top or bottom, you know, and saying how if you are top, if you're masculine, you're the man, you're not even, uh, there's nothing that affects your masculinity. Uh, if you're on the other side, then you're feminine, then you might even, we uh, will call you gay, we'll call you a girl. And... Uh, and that affects the dynamic a lot between um, between people engaging in, in this practice. When young boys are offered opportunities to engage in a, in a behavior with a client where they are, the boys are on top, are providing the masculine kind of role as perceived by them, 
then it's there's no there's no issue there there's no problem and uh, it's something they celebrate we've heard or seen cases where the the young boys are showing off with, with what they're doing in front of their other kids creating pressure and uh, and temptation for others to engage in this um while will you while if you are on the other side or if there's pressure for you to be to be on the other side on the receiving end of of intercourse then then that that puts that affects and destroys your sense of manhood or masculinity as uh, self-worth and self-esteem and that also uh, leads to to all kinds of um, of cases of, of abuse and and, um, and and depression and all kinds of uh, um, issues that might be damaging to their uh, their self-esteem um, we've seen lots of young people who are homeless and that's not very uh, looked at very closely um, of the refugee community because there's so many of them who are in the shelters or in the refugee camps and counted for but there are others who fall through the cracks and who just like stay and sleep homeless in the parks and um, and that provides a, a just a perfect space for the clients to approach them and and, um, and um, create a need for them to engage in this practice um, and often we've heard that this was the first experience for many of them when they were homeless and they're sleeping on the bench park, the park benches, is when somebody approached them the first night, the second night, the third night, and then they maybe couldn't say no eventually. They thought, okay, this is the only way out for me where I can get some money or I can go and get a shower and a clean bed for the night with somebody. Um, so that's, uh, and that's, and that's, we haven't seen lots of attention, capacity of service provision to, to work directly to take people out of homelessness when they are in these situations. Um, when we talk about the institutional side of things and from programmatic and service delivery, again, I want to, to reiterate the issue of translation interpretation is creating one of the most institutional uh, barriers around providing efficient services for uh, for people engaging in survival sex. Um, we can also talk about um, the services in the camps um, and in form from both government and NGO and international organization side um, are not always efficient. Um, um, it's not it's not 24 hours 24 hours a day sometimes there's no services on the weekends and the evenings um, and doesn't mean that somebody's staying in a camp or accommodation center at their call as they are called sometimes that means that they are uh, getting the full uh, protection or services that they they need often the the cases of abuse and exploitation happen in the camps and without um, ongoing protection services and supervision um, around the clock, um, this this happens quite quite a bit, especially at night and, and during the day. And this is where we, we start talking about girls in this situation. Because it's true that we do not see girls outside in public in the parks soliciting for uh, sex to engage in survival sex. Uh, it's not as common and, and, and as often seen, but uh, we start hearing these stories in the camps and in the accommodation centers where there is uh, gaps in, in protection services and supervision. Um, there's also not a very clear approach uh, for accommodation of unaccompanied minors in, um, in these different accommodation centers uh, and camps in Greece where different camps, different locations in the country, islands and mainland uh, will find discrepancy in services. So it's, it's much more difficult to, to create a harmonized system that can be easily implemented and monitored and evaluated uh, across the board because it's not it's not one system that that looks the same everywhere in the in the country. Um, in this whole story, I mean, I'm trying to start to sum up now. Um, we need to really understand um, what's behind the scenes of the story. Um, there's very complex social, political, historic, and economic circumstances that lead young people to engage in such harmful behaviors um, and make it make have them make this very difficult decision to practice survival sex. Um, this practice is judged very harshly and very negatively um, by by them, their culture, their their community. It's considered immoral. It's a sin. Um, we are just not just talking about sex outside marriage, but we are also talking about sex with somebody from the same gender. We are talking about sex for money. Uh, for many of them, it's, it could be the first time they've engaged in sex, their first sexual experiences. 
Um, so this is already, we have this big cloud that says that this is a horrible thing that they're doing. Um, and they are seeing it, seeing it themselves, although they're engaging as, as something, that, something that is very sinful and very immoral. Um, and to engage in it is not an easy thing. It's not an easy decision just to say, okay, the other boys are doing it. Let me do it and go get me, myself 20 euros, 40 euros, 50 euros today. Um, but there is this, this, this sense of lack of self-worth and dignity uh, that they are feeling. And that comes from this, this, these extreme conditions that they have been living through. Um, the policies, the structures, um, the, 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 the whole situation, from the minute they're leaving home, whether Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq, until they arrive here, uh, they are told by everything around them that they are less than others. They are forced to live in poverty. They, they don't have legal status. Their dreams of going further to Europe and fulfill their, their, their mission and dream is, is denied because of the policies of, uh, of, uh, of the whole situation, and especially more recently the, more, the, the Europe-Turkey deal. Um, they they sit around and look at other boys and other young people living a much more normal life that looks more glorified for them and beautiful and, and, and fun and real, while they are not allowed to do that. All of this is telling them, you are not good enough. You are not the same level of humanity that we all enjoy. You are not, you don't have that self-worth. You don't have the same dignity that we all have. So once you, you get to that point, this is what, what really eventually would lead somebody to engage in a harmful behavior. Um, when they say, why am I going to protect myself, take care of myself, if I am not as good as everybody else? Um, so if we're not having this, um, this, this model of normal life that comes from family, from schooling, from adult support, from care, love, guidance through through. Uh, others in our community that are designated by by every society to take care of us. Um, why would we have that sounds judgment and healthy assessment of what 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 this risk would be? Um, and it is very important for us to really look at a full story of every human being before we start like addressing the immediate behavior. It's not just about somebody having sex behind a tree for five euros for ten euros. Um, and, and this is where we're talking about, you know, solutions that has to do with the, with the money or with the just like, you know, uh, advising them of what to do or what not to do at that moment. It's understanding everything that's leading people to, to, to get to that point. Um, and with this, we start talking about like this whole idea of masculinity. Um, when we self-identify as masculine human beings, especially the young ones, uh, when we see how masculinity is perceived by others, one, by our culture and community, by our peers and friends around us, by the host community, by, by service providers, when they see us as children and, and we don't see, it, see us ourselves as such, when a culture back home says like you have to be a man, even when you're still five years old, we start treating you as such, and you start, you have to behave in a certain way. And with that sense of masculinity comes sexual prowess, and comes, you know, uh, taking decisions on your own without consulting with others, without getting advice. Um, we are uh, judged in a certain way because on, our masculinity is judged because of our small behaviors. And there's an assumption about who we are based on the, the things that we do and how we behave and how we take care of ourselves and how independent we are. This is all is in the center of what drives these young men and boys to make such, such decisions. And it's also where we need to start searching when looking at this harmful impact uh, of these practices psychologically and socially. At the end, I would have to say again and, and repeat it, this is, there's no uh, two stories are the same. We cannot look at uh, young people engaging in survival sex at refugees as one homogeneous group. We can't... Uh, forget that these are individual human beings coming from different backgrounds with different dreams and different stories and different different mindsets. So our lack of ability and competency as service providers to understand the cultural context of any particular group 
combined with their particular lived experience is what's going to limit our response uh, for planning and action. We have to, at the end of the day, look at every experience as an experience that is relevant to, to the action that we are designing. We have to look at our own cultural competency or incompetency of perceiving this experience, of our own, own lived experience and how we use that to make that judgment on other people's lived experience before we start designing uh, supportive, efficient, functional working services and responses to, to all these young people that we are trying to care for.